Hello. Good evening. Welcome to the Museum of Science. I'm James Wetzel, the co-producer of Adult Programs, and I am very excited to welcome you to our very special live taping with Nancy. Um, before, yes, let's hear it. <laughs> Tonight, we are so lucky to have the team behind the critically acclaimed Nancy here with us for a very special live taping of their hit podcast. For three seasons, Kathy Tu and Tobin Lowe have brought the stories, conversations, and faces of the queer experience to the forefront, quickly becoming one of the most popular podcasts across all genres. And recently, they kicked off their fourth season with what are, in my opinion, some of their strongest episodes to date, proving that they are just getting started. This evening, they have put together an incredible lineup of stories and very special guests that we can't wait to share with you. But before I turn it over to them, I just want to give a massive thank you to their entire team, especially to Kathy, Tobin, and Matt Collette, and everyone at WNYC Studios, the home of Nancy. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us, spending your Thursday night at this really special program. Um, we hope to see you back here at the museum soon. Um, but for now, please join me in welcoming your co-hosts, Kathy Chu and Tobin Lowe, with Nancy. Wow. Wow. Hey. You were already exercised today. I know I went to the gym this morning. I feel terrible. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Tobin. Hi, I'm Kathy. <laughs> we are the co-hosts of Nancy. It is a queer podcast. Uh, if you don't know what this show is, I'm confused why you're here, but welcome. We apologize in advance. This is going to be very confusing for you. <laughs> um, or, not. or not. Yeah. Could be fine. Yeah. Go with it. Go with the wave. Yeah. Um, so... We are at the Museum of Science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Science, am Science. I right? Science. <laughs> Physics. Yeah. Biology. Zoology. Um, astronomy. Chemi chemistry? Yes, yes. <laughs> chemistry. Um, we don't know science. We don't know science, Yeah, you guys. science always scared me in school. Yeah, when we got this booking, we were like, oh, no. <laughs> So tonight, we're going to do our best with what we're going to call Nancy Tries, tries to, to Science. science. <laughs> Here we go. Tobin's going to try to science. I'm going to try to science. Our friends are going to try to science. Also, there is a very important ballot initiative coming up for everyone who is voting in this state, and we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we will. So I guess I'm first. <laughs> okay. This is weird because I'm on the wrong side of him usually. Yeah, we, usually yeah, we're, we're flipped. It's like sleeping on the is, wrong ugh, side of the it's bed. It's weird. Okay. But it's fine. We're fine. <laughs> we're fine. <sighs> All right, Tobin, science. Okay. Uh, I want to preface this by saying in high school, I took basic biology, basic chemistry, and nothing else. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he went to college for cello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And so, like, before you assume that I was, like, wearing leather jackets and, like, listening to jazz and, like, smoking cigarettes, um, this was me. Yeah. Look at him. So cute. Look at him. Also, There's five of him. Also, I... <laughs> Why is there five of you? <laughs> I'm pretty sure my mom had this made. This is, like, a thing that she did. Also, I look, I look 12 years old in this photo. I'm actually 18 in that photo, yeah. Um, but given tonight's theme about science, I tried to like remember what I could. Um, and the one thing that came to mind was the scientific method. Okay, so let's review the steps together. Yeah, together, everybody. I have to read it because I forget the steps. First okay, step. here we go. Make an observation, right? Yeah. Next up, form a question. Next up, form a hypothesis. <laughs> Next up, conduct an experiment. Okay, draw a conclusion. And finally, repeat. So, Good job, Tobin. Thank you. <laughs> 
So we talk a lot on our show about the commonalities of the queer experience. So like the process of figuring yourself out, that is something you could say that a lot of queer people share. Um, maybe time spent trying to have to deny who you are. That is also something that I think a lot of queer people share. Um, but perhaps one of the most universal experiences I can think of is that many of the queer people I know at one point or another have been asked to officiate a straight couple's wedding. <laughs> um, you know, you like do a little speech, do the vows, basically be master of ceremonies. Uh, Kathy, Matt, our producer, myself, we have all been asked to officiate weddings at one point or another, which brings us to the scientific method. Uh, so that was my observation. Now we're gonna form a question. Why is that? <laughs> Why do we so often get asked by Ted and Karen to be Karen and Ted's gay friend who officiates their wedding? Why does this happen? Yes, why? Um, there's a couple theories I could throw out there. Um, perhaps they feel awkward about where to put us in the wedding party if they like pair us with a bridesmaid or a groomsman, respectively. Mm. But they want to keep like the classic look. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Perhaps they want that like particular umami flavor of oppression at their <laughs> wedding. <laughs> you know, just sprinkle it in there. Um, I think it could be a mix of all of these things, but I have formed a hypothesis. Uh, why do I think that queer people get asked to do this all the time? Um, it's because we're just better at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every wedding I have been to where a queer person officiated, they have killed it. <laughs> they know that it's like part comedy routine, part speech, part serious, like they have just done so much better. Um, and so, Oh, I also wanted to say, sorry, I'm following my notes now. We're not as bogged down by a lifetime of expectation of like what this thing is supposed to be, like what is a wedding, what does all this mean? It's like a hilarious experiment to us. <laughs> it's like when I try to Vogue. <laughs> um, okay, and speaking of experiments, here we go. We're gonna conduct an experiment. So, I decided to have two coworkers, one gay, one straight, officiate a fake ceremony <laughs> to see who was better. First, a gay specimen. <laughs> this is Matt. First question, who are you and how do you know Kathy and I? I'm Matt, I'm your senior producer and only producer. And friend. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, Matt. <laughs> so Matt comes into this with a lot of advantages. He's actually officiated two weddings before. Also, he has a lot of opinions about what you shouldn't do at a wedding. Some people are like, we're just going to do the vows. They walk down, and then they're up there for like three minutes. And I hate that, because they are too short. Flip side, cannot be too long. I do not really want to go to a mass at your wedding. I want like two good readings. I generally don't like poetry at weddings, but I also just generally don't like poetry. The garter toss, it's really boring. And at one point you're standing there trying to catch your cousin's underwear. <laughs> it's a real thing. What? It's terrible. I once also caught the bouquet by accident. <laughs> So that is Matt, our producer, um, challenging Matt Collette in this competition of wedding officiating will be our straight coworker, Matthew Larson. Now, Matthew has never officiated a wedding. He was also super nervous when I said that he had to do this. <laughs> um, but before you count him out, you should know that this Matthew has one major advantage. G'day, mate. He is Australian. Australian. <laughs> Okay, and everything sounds better with an Australian accent. It's so true, it's so true. It's like more charming, more fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, also, I had so many questions for him. <laughs> Do people in Australia really put shrimps on the barbie? I put prawns on the barbie. And we can't, you can't buy Foster's beer. I don't know what that is. Foster's Australian for beer. Uh, yeah, that's a, okay. yeah. Right. You right. also had a lot of questions. You just talked for a while about Australian celebrities. What about Nicole Kidman? I think she's pretty, pretty big. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hugh, Hugh Jackman's Hugh pretty... Jackman. Yeah. Mm, got it. He's pretty uh, big news. He's big news. Got yeah. it. The Hemsworth brothers. 
Big news. Yeah. I got them all. <laughs> Big news. <laughs> so, we have our two test subjects. Now we just needed a couple for them to marry. But where to find a couple willing to get fake married just for a podcast? Oh. <laughs> Uh, things I do for you. True story. We took this as like a promo shot for the podcast and we got them back and we we're like, oh no, this is just an engagement shot. <laughs> yeah, why did this happen? I don't know. It just comes out in us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here are the rules of the experiment. Each officiant would get one day to write a short speech for our theoretical wedding. They were free to say whatever they wanted, uh, as long as it included something about the nature of love and marriage. And then Kathy and I are going to vote on a winner. Mm -hmm. But first, we had to send them off to write. They each got five minutes to ask Kathy and I questions about anything, really, like how we met, the nature of our relationship, mm -hmm. anything that would help them with their officiating duties. You can ask us any questions for five minutes, starting now. Like now? Yes. Oh, I thought we were doing this. OK. Don't go to bed angry at each other. I um, mean, no, no, th this is the wrong time for that. Um, oh, I'm on the Wait, spot. no, no, no. You don't have to officiate right now. No, 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 no. You just need to add, like, is there anything that you need to know from us? You know, how long have you guys been together? Do you want, like, some interest in, like, a higher power? Is there something that brought us together, or is it just you guys? What are some of your common interests? Not going to parties. Oh, my God. I love not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to get married to each other? Kathy and I make good partners because we are very yin and yang in a way that works. What's your favorite memory that you have of spending time together? We took a long trip, and at the end of the trip, we didn't kill each other. That's when I was like, this is it. That was so recent. <laughs> OK, that was when you were like, this is for real? That was like this past year. What do you guys think marriage is? What does it mean to you? It is some of the hardest work you'll ever do. Who told you that? I viewed it from my parents. <laughs> and how will your marriage affect me professionally and personally? Oh, it's gonna make it so much worse. Oh no. <laughs> and time is up. <laughs> so. They got their five minutes of questions, and with that, we sent them off to write their ceremonies. Okay, you prepared. Are you guys ready for this? <laughs> I don't know if we are. <laughs> we've got a lifetime together, so. That's true. I mean, uh, wow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Well, we have only been in love for a year, apparently. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, so fast forward to the next day. We pulled them back into the studio for our fake wedding ceremony. First up, Nancy producer and homosexual Matt Collette. <laughs> Matt, uh, if you will remember, walked in extremely cocky. Oh my God. Extremely relaxed. Wait, okay, so before we get into your sermon, I just want to ask you, what was your process in putting together your uh, ceremony for today? So, uh, it's 1.42 right now. Uh-huh. About an hour ago, uh -huh. I remembered that I had to do this, and then I <laughs> leaned over and I asked you what I was supposed to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then you told me, and then I did a couple other things, and then at like 1.05 to 1.20, maybe, I wrote on four Post-its. Yeah. Wow. Very confident. Mackle. Very confident. Um, okay, so I want everyone right now to imagine Kathy and I uh, maybe in matching suits. Uh, perhaps an adorable dog has walked our rings down the aisle. Absolutely. A droid has hovered over us to drop veils onto our heads. <laughs> Doves are cooing nearby, waiting to be released to celebrate our love. Yeah. Um, and with that tasteful ceremony, uh, Matt begins his sermon. And uh, now, before you take your vows, I'm going to give a little speech. Okay, I'm going right. to close my eyes for this. Yeah, me too. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt. I'm Tobin and Kathy's senior producer, and they also said I needed to note friend. Uh, the first thing I ever knew about Tobin and Kathy was that they were gay. And then the second thing I ever knew about them was that they were best friends. 
And that was basically their whole podcast pitch. <laughs> so I knew that they had this like meaningful and deep relationship, professional, personal. I was, I was really surprised when they were like, Matt, we want to get married. <laughs> and I was a little taken aback for a variety of reasons. One, of course, they're both in serious relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, two, to the best of my knowledge, this wedding doesn't align with their sexualities mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And third, I guess, just because marriage is bigger than friendship. It's even bigger than maybe a work marriage. Work wife, work husband. It's bigger than all of that. Because marriage is a promise. And it's not one you take lightly. It's a promise you make in public, surrounded by your loved ones. It's something that people have fought hard for and waited their entire lifetimes for. The vows you're about to take probably say something about how you're going to stay together for richer and poorer, sicker and in health, as long as you both shall live. I'm going to tell you about half of that stuff doesn't matter. You don't need to make a really big promise to stay together when you're richer. You don't need to make a very big promise to stay together when there's health. You're making a very big promise in front of Basically, everyone you know, uh, potentially maybe this live show audience, if they're hearing this, you're making this very big promise for the hard parts, for the sicker, for the poorer, for basically all the times it might just be easier for you to go your own way. So that's what you're promising each other today. With everyone here as your witnesses, with everyone here to support you and hold you accountable, that you are staying together for the hard stuff, for the stuff that you don't even imagine could happen right now. You don't need to make a promise for the good stuff, but you have to make a promise for the hard stuff. Hopefully, it's not too hard. Hopefully, that stuff doesn't come for a really long time. That's what you're promising today. And that's what your marriage is. And those are my four post-its. It's time to get married. <laughs> time to get married. That was nice. Thank you. How am I being judged? Where does the science kick in? <laughs> <laughs> Where indeed does the science kick in? <laughs> Yeah, so that was, uh, well, we're in it. Okay. Science is happening all around us. <laughs> um, so that was Matt Collette's ceremony. Mm. Kathy, what did you think? It's beautiful. I could have done without a lot of the digs at the beginning. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. I actually really liked it. You really liked it? I thought it did the like highs and lows very nice, like the assy classy divide of what? like funny <laughs> sassy but like serious and he like brought yeah. it home at the yeah, end yeah, yeah yeah i i was a big fan but also there was music oh i did that part though yeah, sorry I know. <laughs> okay so next up is matthew larson our sweet sweet australian co-worker um matthew walked in the studio with a pile of handwritten notes and then a handful of typed up notes and he was ready and nervous as hell. Oh my God. Real quick, I want you to shake your shoulders out. I'm sensing some nerves. Are you a little nervous? No, nah, I mean, <laughs> who's on the radio every day, eh? <laughs> 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 to be fair, this is for a live show, so a large-ish uh, large uh, audience. Yeah, no, that makes it better. <laughs> no, not nervous anymore. <laughs> no, I'm okay. 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 So once again, um, uh, suits, dogs, droids, doves, all of the things. <laughs> uh, here is Matthew Larson. We are gathered today for a solemn event, <laughs> profoundly hopeful, but infinitely difficult. We are here to celebrate the wedding of Kathy and Tobin. A good marriage is not one where troubles are magically absent, it is one where troubles are faced with insight and generosity. Humility is probably the most important emotion for the success of a relationship. Humility starts with an ample, accurate, and sorrowful recognition of all one's failings. It is filled with an apology, sorry, it's filled with apology and modesty. It doesn't pretend that flaws are charming quirks or excusable oddities. It contains an open admission that we are, ch that we are charming quirks. God oh, damn it. Um, <laughs> it's okay, keep going. I'll just read that part again. It contains an open admission that we're charming quirks or excusable additions. Oh shit. 
Sorry, I like screwed up my typing here and I'm like, <laughs> hang on. Um, you got you're it. You're doing great. I love it so far. Okay. Yeah, it was really nice. All right, I'm going to go back to close my eyes. Okay. Tobin, do you admit that you have failed? <laughs> that you are a failed, broken human being? Not in every way, but in some ways so serious that at points you will be, you will be a grave burden to Kathy. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. This is serious. And what about you, Kathy? Yes. Perhaps less so. Just kidding. No, we both know that's true. <laughs> ah, so that was sweet, sweet that's Matthew good. Larson. Wow. That's so like, nervous. there's, and then it, there's more like kind of talking about um, where you come together. Oh, that's right. Uh, this is the part where he described that uh, he had planned for us to go uh, uh, on from there and write all of our wrongs in a giant book. <laughs> it was like a book of atonement. <laughs> and that was going to be like the rest of his ceremony, but he didn't have time to get to it because of the time constraints. But that was like his plan. So, Kathy, what did you think? Uh, the Australian accent is <laughs> really just... Also, I should note, earlier that morning, he came up to me. He came in real early before work. Came up to me with stacks of paper and was like, I did some research. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. And I was like, Matt, calm down. <laughs> just show up. So I, I, I thought it was, he, he tried. Yeah. <laughs> he really tried. I thought in the, uh, if for Matt Collette, who went first, if we talked about the balance of good and bad, Let's say maybe Matthew Larson went a little this way. <laughs> I agree, but I did not not enjoy it. All right, the time has come for us to draw a conclusion. Yeah. Um, I know who I'm going to vote for. Matt Collette has been waiting for this moment. He wants to know which one of us is his friend. Okay, so, um, so we, we are between Matt Collette, our producer, gay, Matthew Larson, straight. Why don't we say the last name of the person we're voting for on three? Okay. One, two, three. Colette. Larson. Really? <laughs> Australian, I mean. Also, he prepared. <laughs> Fair. Sorry, Matt. Hi. <laughs> um, so I think we got to do an audience vote. Yeah. Okay. If you enjoyed homosexual Matt Collette ceremony more, please applaud now. Okay, that okay. Was good. That was good. Get a sense of that. If you enjoyed straight Matthew Larson's ceremony more, please Australian. applaud now. <laughs> okay. It's all right. Matt, you won. We ha <laughs> <laughs> ah. But here's the thing about science. Um, now that we have concluded the experiment, the scientific the scientific method demands that we repeat. <laughs> and the only way we can repeat is if, I actually don't have a ring, but Kathy. No, shut it down. In front of shut all these down. people. Shut it down. Shut it down. You said you did legs today. <laughs> and that's my time. <laughs> All right, my turn mm -hmm. to science. I, uh, if I can say, I took a step closer to science. <laughs> Sorry, Tobin. That's fine. So I'm not great with science, as you've heard already. And what the only thing I could think of when I was <laughs> like, I'm gonna do a science show, was NASA. <laughs> so I decided to bug a NASA scientist who happens to be queer. Her name is Kathleen Vanderkaden. I am an experimental petrologist. I know what you're thinking. What the hell is that? <laughs> Here we go. I build planets in the lab. I take data from spacecrafts of planetary surfaces, and I try to recreate the planetary interiors in the lab. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. <laughs> I would explain it to you, but... I don't understand it. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she explained it a few times. <laughs> I was like, great, all right, moving on. 
So one of the first things Kathy and I talked about was, does your sexuality impact your work as a scientist at all? And she told me this story. I uh, was an undergrad uh, on a field trip, and the professor was showing us some uh, different formations that you could see. And in geology, there's um, something called a dike, which is when you have a body of magma that's essentially intruding across another already established landform. Next slide. Dyke. <laughs> is that really how it's spelled? It's spelled this way and also D-I-K-E. Okay. I went with the clearly. Naturally. More, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is a body of magma that's intruding across an already established landform. So our professor was pointing this out and discussing it, and then um, a gentleman in our class looked at me and my partner at the time and started laughing at us. Like, oh, I see dykes over here, too. Ha, 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 not funny. Nobody laughed. Great. I was going <laughs> to yell at all of you. I offered to hunt down that person. Kathleen said that that's a fine years ago. Happy to say there's been much fewer incidences like that, but I think in general, I would say for me personally, being a woman in science is more of a struggle than being a gay woman in science. So there's a lot to unpack there, but it's not every day that I get to talk to a NASA scientist, mm -hmm. so I did not waste any time on the bigger questions. I had very specific questions that I needed to ask her. Questions from Twitter. <laughs> Presenting questions that are too dumb for a NASA scientist to answer, and we should probably feel bad about it, but we're not asking anyway. <laughs> and I really thought that these were like all questions from Twitter, but turns out our social media person, Caroline, asked most of these. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Caroline, what are you doing? <laughs> Anyways, let's go to some of the questions. What's the gayest thing to happen in space? <laughs> the gayest thing to happen in space. Um, gosh, I don't even, not even sure I know what that means. But we do have some planetary bodies and moons of other planets that are named after like gay Roman deities. I can't think of those names off the top of my head, but I know that they exist. That would probably have to be it. Okay, all right, next question. What is sneeze etiquette in space? I think that you just sneeze and then you just sit in your own germs, I would guess, because <laughs> it's not like you can take your helmet off, right? Not so don't good. sneeze in space, I'd go with. Let's go with that. <laughs> next question. If you were pulled into the vacuum of space, would you boil alive? I don't think so. I think you would freeze to death or like your head would explode. Don't quote me on that. I like that we went ahead and quoted her on that. <laughs> <laughs> she knew what she was getting into. Next question. Why does space smell weird? What a weird question. I'm not sure anyone's ever really smelt space. <laughs> that was her answer. Next question. How heavy are the shoes on the space suits? I'm not sure how heavy they are. I know that the space suits in general are being completely redesigned because you know the ones that the Apollo astronauts wore were far too clunky and if you ever watch any of those videos you just see them like tripping and falling and then they can't get up and it's a disaster. Have you guys YouTubed this? It's really funny, do it. <laughs> Next question, what happens if you're not feeling well in space? Essentially with um, a lot of suction the bathrooms have to like just kind of continuously be sucking everything out into you know a waste container or whatever so that it's not just sitting around you because that's actually what would happen wait i didn't realize is this a diarrhea question yes it was oh i thought it was an illness question okay that makes a lot more I mean, sense it could now. be vomit too i guess but um next question are aliens real um, not at liberty to discuss that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, I, aliens in terms of, like, Marvin the Martian, 
personally, I'm going to go with no. Um, is there life elsewhere? I'm going to say personally, there has to be. So there is. She said it. It's real. <laughs> so the last thing I asked her was, is there anything that you think is surprising that we should all know about? One of the interesting things that I found is just how many members of the LGBT community there actually are in STEM disciplines. And I know right now, especially for science, we have a huge push to have more women in STEM. And I feel that perhaps we forget sometimes about the other minority groups. But in terms of LGBT, we have a, we have a greater presence than I think anyone realizes, which I think is kind of like a, a superpower that we have um, in the field. So there's just enough of us to be dangerous, if you say, and actually start affecting change. Conclusion, scientists, queer scientists are dangerous. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> So up next in uh, Nancy Tries to Science, we are bringing up our good friend Nick Anderson to tell a story about how our bodies work and what happens when they don't work properly. Please welcome Nick to the stage. Just for a note, that's my boyfriend, so. <laughs> and the story's about him. Um, he knows. So when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, um, there are a couple of things that you have to know before you're allowed to leave the pediatric intensive care unit. Um, as you can see, we're currently not in the William Beaumont Memorial Hospital pediatric intensive care unit, so I learned these things. Uh, back when I was 11, and I thought I'd share some with you tonight. The first thing they tell you um, before you're able to leave the pediatric intensive care unit when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is you have to be able to explain what it is that diabetes is. So when all of you, or most of you, some of you may also be diabetic out there, hey, um, when you eat, your body is able to process your food. Your body produces, well, the islet cells living inside your pancreas produce insulin, which breaks apart the energy in your food and allows it to enter into your bloodstream and be distributed out to the rest of your body so you can eat and, and process that energy. Um, my body decided right around when I was 10 or 11 that my islet cells were a disease. And so I have very effective white blood cells in one sense because they just went on and killed those islet cells, like really good. And uh, I stopped making insulin. Um, and that's essentially the basics of diabetes. So that's the first thing you had to do. And it was important for me to learn how to do that when I was in the pediatric intensive care unit because I really wanted to be in control of my story. I wanted to be able to say, who I was and what was going on in my life. Um, the second thing you have to know before you leave the pediatric intensive care unit when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is you have to be able to inject insulin. Insulin, as I previously was discussed, uh, I, don't, I don't have any going on in my body. Um, and so you have to inject it. Um, I take two different types of insulin. I take a short acting before I eat, um, and it allows me to process the food that I've, I've eaten. And I take a long acting um, at night that gives me sort of stasis. Um, they wanted my family and I, because I was 11 at the time, to all be able to inject insulin. Um, the nurse came in, and she had this orange and a, and a syringe. And she said, OK, so we're going we're gonna to practice. And you should think of this like a dart. My mother, who was very squeamish and not really one for darts, um, <laughs> impaled that orange <laughs> and I decided right then that I will be the only one in this family who will be injecting insulin into themselves because it was really important that I be in control of my body and this was a huge part of diabetes for me and the third and vital thing that they make you learn before you leave the pediatric intensive care unit when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is how to treat high and low blood sugar blood sugar is essentially give or take the amount of glucose that exists in your blood most of you all of you I'm gonna go and assume I don't want to know much I don't know much about how your body processes food um, your blood glucose is pretty stable because of the aforementioned insulin. Um, if I don't properly regulate the insulin I take, sometimes my blood sugar can get high. There's too much glucose in my blood sugar. Um, the way that feels is kind of dizzy. You're kind of confused. 
Um, and you can alleviate that by taking more insulin or working out or going on a run or sort of, you know, getting that excess glucose out of your system. Um, the opposite of that low blood sugar, when you are below stasis and are sort of in a dis different kind of dizzy stase, um, there are a lot of different ways of treating that. You can drink some grapefruit juice, have a glucose tablet, which is like a really concentrated amount of sugar, or uh, you can use the most terrifying needle I've ever seen in my entire life called a, gluco a glucagon. Um, in my head, the needle is like 10 feet long, but the way that they explained it in the ICU was, so here's a glucagon, you should just inject it in yourself, you should explain it to everyone around you that if ever you get really low, um, they should just whip it out and impale you. Um, <laughs> colleagues, roommates, friends, you know, anybody. Um, this was pretty terrifying to me then. It, as you can tell, it's still terrifying to me now. Um, but it, it seemed like I'm going to work on figuring out everything else around low blood sugar, but I'm not going to work on that. In practice, I've discovered that low blood sugar to me um, is all about hiding. I, I avoid other people. I get convinced, I get very paranoid, and I get convinced when I have low blood sugar that everyone around me knows I'm a diabetic, knows that I've failed in some way, um, and they're judging me. Um, and so I hide, sometimes I kick, um, I've bitten a lot of EMTs. Uh, why that seemed like an effective way of dealing with a little blood sugar, I couldn't explain to you. Um, but more or less, back when I was 11, one, I didn't know all of this about my little blood sugar, but two, I, I'd figured it out and it was important, again, because I wanted to be in control of the way I experienced the world. And I didn't want people around me to know that I was a diabetic. It, it worked for a pretty long time. I had friends throughout middle school and high school and even into college who would often you know, offer me a piece of cake and be like, oh, I forgot you were a diabetic. And I would say, well, you know, I'll, I'll eat the cake and I'll take more insulin, but um, I just, I liked that people, I was so on top of it that people didn't know. Um, that stopped after college. Changing lifestyles, maybe alcohol, it was definitely alcohol, um, <laughs> or, it's, who really knows, and my endocrinologists haven't been able to figure it out, but it, after college, I realized there's a fourth thing they don't tell you in the pediatric intensive care unit. They, they should definitely not tell an 11-year-old, but they should definitely tell a 25-year-old, and that's what to do when you have low blood sugar when you're having sex. <laughs> I can provide some examples. Um, <laughs> there was a guy I was seeing immediately after college who was a little bit older than I was, uh, and he had kept telling me how much every time we had sex, he loved how distant I got, and he thought I was just really like in this mind space, um, sort of just living in the experience, and what he didn't realize is that every time we had had sex, uh, I couldn't remember it because I, my blood sugar was so low that up until the point, I, I'm not trying to make this sound worse than it already is, uh, I just really wasn't fully present, and um, I was biting him at that much because uh, <laughs> my blood sugar was low. Um, another bo serious boyfriend of mine never really understood why Every time we started to have sex, I would just kind of fade away. Um, and he thought, you know, I wasn't really that into him. He wasn't wrong, but he also <laughs> didn't understand that every time we would like sort of think about having sex, I would just drink enough beer that my blood sugar would plummet and I would sort of avoid <laughs> having to do anything. Um, but then I met Luke, who as you'll know is here. Um, and we met at this potluck. It's this weekly dinner that we all go to with a bunch of friends. He was already a regular, um, and I started going pretty regularly. And uh, because I'm really thick at it, I really didn't understand when he asked me out, but he did. Um, and we started going out. And um, he's a lot nicer than I am. Um, he's a better person, I think, in every way. Um, and so I really didn't understand what he saw and why he was continuing to date me. Uh, but we kept dating, and things got pretty serious. Pretty early on in our relationship, we were out at this party. Um, I drank too much beer and didn't eat enough food, and after we went back to his apartment, we got naked and started making out, as you do, and then I passed out. And when I woke up, there were a bunch of, I should note, very good-looking EMTs, <laughs> all of whom could probably have gotten it. Um, <laughs> But there was also an IV in my arm, and I had boxers on, which was confusing, because when I had gone to bed, you know, not gone to bed, when I had passed out, I didn't have that on. And I wasn't, I was confused as to whether or not Luke had entered into some sort of very elaborate role-playing sexual fantasy <laughs> with me, or if something else had happened. Um, at a certain point, um, my glucose, my blood glucose had risen enough that the EMTs 
what sadly went away. <laughs> and Luke, by this point, was dressed, um, came over and you know grabbed my wrist, and he was like, "I want to know how to keep that from happening again." And I was terrified because if someone that I had been seeing like kind of seriously had passed out in the middle of sex, I mean, I would have been gone. Like I, I would have. I would have revived them enough to a point to be like, hey, here's some grapefruit juice. Maybe don't call me anymore. Um, <laughs> but this wouldn't have been my response. But he said, like, I don't want that to happen again. And you're like, I didn't want that to happen again either. But he said, no, I want to know what I can do to prevent it from happening. And so we talked about glucose tablets and we talked about grapefruit juice. Um, and it seemed to work. The other day I was at my endocrinologist and she said, you know, this hasn't you haven't really had any catastrophic lows in a long time, and I can't, I can't figure it out. You know, I don't understand. In my fridge at home, uh, there's a glucagon, that really long needle. Uh, it's behind our, the cat food, and um, I'm pretty sure ago, but I've never had occasion to use it because um, I don't think I need it. I, two years ago in May, uh, Luke and I moved in together, and. Uh, Glucagon or not, I know that I have the uh, the best low blood sugar treatment I could possibly have, and that's him. Thank you. Aww. What a ceremony speech, you know. <laughs> Thank you for providing a beautiful story and also actual science. <laughs> you really rounded up the whole thing for us. Um, okay, so one thing I want to know is who in this room is voting in Massachusetts? Yeah, okay, yes. awesome. Who knows about question three? Okay, cool. I like that. I like that ratio. One thing that you might not know about is how the folks who are uh, who are trying to get yes on three to happen are going about talking to folks about what it all means, and why they should vote yes. Uh, and thankfully, our superstar producer, Matt Collette, has been reporting on that very thing. So please welcome to the stage, Matt Collette. Award-winning superstar producer. Thank you very much. Matt, I'm getting there. Oh. This, <laughs> there, oh there we go. So I think, okay, that's slightly worrying. I was controlling it from up there, and it's supposed to work on my phone. Um, well, I'm too far away. Well, I'm just going to tell you things. Well, can I just tell you when to hit the space bar? This is, this is how the magic happens. Okay, so it's time for a vocab word. Slide. Uh, and that word is inoculation. And I just want to point out right here, if like any of us use this definition in school, we would not get a good grade. Because the definition is just the word. <laughs> so let's, like, let's use an example. Let's talk about a flu shot. Give me the shot. I want to go on my vacation. I take back all the stuff I said. If you want a shot, you're going to have to dance for it. <laughs> so the flu vaccine works at least in theory. Very nice. I didn't realize how long this was. <laughs> so the flu vaccine works, at least in theory, by exposing your body to the influenza virus in this really controlled dose. So then when you wind up exposed to the flu in the wild, your white blood cells, which are on this slide, know what to do. Uh, inoculation works for like all kinds of things. It's the reason you probably never had measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, if you're young enough, HPV or even chicken pox, which is just wild, because that seems like a formative experience. <laughs> Uh, but so here's my question. Can you inoculate against an idea? Slide. <laughs> I'm glad that it still worked when I said slide, because this feels <laughs> horrific. Uh, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been coming up here to Massachusetts to do a story on question three. And I had this whole theory when I started, because I was like, Massachusetts is this wildly liberal place. It's a... Uh, it's a place where, you know, you got Kennedys and gay marriage and, like, a Republican governor signed into law the thing that became Obamacare. But then you have question three. And I suddenly was really interested in this, not this question, uh, but the strategy being used to win the fight. Uh, 
And that the idea that's being attacked is, slide, transphobia. This is a good definition, a lot better one. Uh, and not everybody knows they're transphobic, but a lot of people still are. Uh, and that's because a lot of people, which you guys not included because you're like not a good sample because you opted into coming to like a queer podcast at the Museum of Science. <laughs> but a lot of people just don't know any trans people at all. And uh, that puts them at risk to something like this. Slide. What does Massachusetts question three mean to you? It means any man who says he is a woman can enter a woman's locker room, dressing room, or bathroom at any time. Even convicted sex offenders. And if you see something suspicious and say something to authorities, you could be the one arrested and fined up to $50,000. It's like the horror movie sounds there. It's like, three. This bathroom bill puts our privacy and safety at risk. It's like, it goes this is, too far. This is designed to scare people. And the thing is, it can work really well. Because like most people don't have a baseline understanding of trans people, but they have a baseline understanding of of sex offenders and like creepy music and like gasps and like this can be really unnerving. So that's what brings us back to this idea of inoculation. Slide. There we go. Um, so what the yes on three people are doing, has anybody been like ca canvassed or like had them knock on your door? I can't actually see you, but I believe you. Uh, so what they do, as I've been going around with them, uh, and this strategy has been fascinating, because what they do is they knock on your door and they say, hey, I'm here talking about this issue. How do you think you'll vote? Maybe here's a personal story. And then what they do is they take out a tablet computer and they say, watch this. And I am like, why in the world are you doing that? But there's actually this good reason, and it's that they're trying to inoculate people against this idea by sh exposing them to something dangerous in a really controlled dose they can actually make it so that when somebody encounters one of those terrible ads or hears something about it on the radio or TV, they understand what it is now, and their body and their brain knows what to do. So uh, what we're going to do is bring up Casey Saverdini. He's the co-chair of the Yes on 3 campaign, uh, and he works for the organization Freedom for All Americans, and he is going to talk about this campaign with Tobin and Kathy. Please welcome Casey. <laughs> Colette, he does it all. What doesn't he do? <laughs> Casey, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having thank me. You. This is great. So uh, as Matt said, you are sort of like a certain kind of audience who opted into a queer podcast at the Museum of Science. But in case <laughs> anyone doesn't know, could you sort of define for us what question three is all about? Yeah, so question three um, is going to ask voters on election day whether or not to uphold the transgender non-discrimination law that passed in 2016 that uh, prohibits discriminating against transgender people in public places like restaurants, retail shops, and hospitals. Um, the law was passed in 2016. It is the final segment in a 10-year saga to pass transgender non-discrimination protections in Massachusetts. In 2011, we were able to pass employment, housing, and education protections. But it's just the public accommodations piece that's on the ballot. And how, how do we get here? How, what, what is happening? Yeah, so a lot of people ask, like, how the hell did this get on the ballot, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, there's, without getting too technical, there's two ways to get on the ballot in Massachusetts. One is a citizen-initiated petition. People are probably really familiar with these. You've probably voted on many of these questions before. People go out, they gather, you know, two, two and a half, 300,000 signatures. They get it on the ballot, people vote. This was different. Um, this is a different mechanism that's actually very rarely used where, but it can happen anytime the legislature passes a law where people right after a law is passed, they have about 90 days to go out and gather a certain number of signatures to get it on the ballot for the, for the people to affirm what the legislature has done. It's actually only been done about 20 times uh, in, in all the time that it's existed since like 1908 wow. or something. It's like really not been done very often. Huh. And most of the times that it's been done uh, are on like tax questions and things like that. It's never been used to, to take away people's rights. Um, and the most important thing about the process for people to know is uh, the way the calculation is done of the number of signatures that are required. There were only 34,000 signatures required to get this on the ballot. Um, for scale, that is less than 1% of the state population. 
Um, after 10 years of this debate, we all have to have it again um, because less than 1% of the population wanted it back on the ballot. Wow. Yeah, Jeez. it's pretty intense. Yeah. So we're coming up on the vote. I imagine your schedule is insane. How are you doing? <laughs> it's just I, my question. I'm generally doing great. I mean, there's people here who are actually working on the campaign who, I mean, I don't even know um, how they deal with the hours that they're doing. Um, the only thing I'm struggling with in this moment is I actually debated the opposition yesterday. Wow. And I think I am still detoxing a little bit from it. I was oh, fine oh doing God. it, but I think I'm a little yeah. bit detoxing still right now. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a highlight? You absorb all of that. You know, <laughs> yeah. Do you have a highlight moment from the debate? Um, probably the first five minutes when we were sparring over what the law actually says and I told them to read it. That felt good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because of course their arguments aren't really about the law. Right. Well, and so you bring up a good point, which is that in this work of debating over this issue, a lot of the folks who are on the front lines having to explain, having to canvas are trans people. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how you take care of yourself, how you take care of your staff when you're sort of having to put your humanity on the line mm -hmm. and defend your humanity. Yeah, it's really difficult, and I actually, and I know there's some people here who are who are both doing that work uh, formally with the campaign, but I know there's some volunteers here too, and I just, I wanna take this opportunity to say like, thank you so much for doing this. I mean, it's it's always hard to go door to door, but to, but to actually, as a person who's being voted on, go and talk people into liking you, um, it's the worst popularity contest I think we could ever possibly be in. Um, you know, that said, I think for me doing this, you know, in, in, in this, this has been two years, it qualified for the ballot in October 2016, like literally right after it went into effect. And the moment that I have dreaded the most for those two years was this debate I had to do yesterday. Just knowing I was gonna have to do this. Um, and, but the reason, you know, people kept saying, well, have someone else do it, you know, why, why do you have to do it? And I just kept thinking, you know, I have it good though. Right, like if the hardest thing I have to do is go sit in a studio for an hour and talk to somebody who's you know generally going to be polite. They're not going to touch me, but they're going to say horrible things. That's nothing like what so many transgender people go through on a daily basis. Right? We have it good. Mm -hmm. Those of us that can go out and volunteer and tell our stories to people at the door, we're the lucky ones. Um, and and the cause that we're fighting for is it's so much bigger. It's not about me. It's not about it's not about our volunteers. It's about this larger community. Um, and in particular, a lot of the young people that are coming up right now who are figuring out who they are and deserve to see people fighting for them because they're worth it. Hmm. Yeah, um, this inoculation strategy that Matt was explaining to us, how did you all go about um, adopting that strategy? Or are there other strategies that, that don't work as well? Like what did, what was that process? Yeah, I mean, at a most basic level, um, traditional uh, field organizing um, is a little bit different than what we're doing. What we're doing is actually, it's called Deep Canvas. That's the science-y name for it. And the conversations- Thank you it's, for the science, I appreciate it. You're, wel <laughs> you're welcome. It's, I am not good at science either, but that's the one thing I know. <laughs> um, but Deep Canvas, so in, you know, in, a, in sort of regular, uh, regular canvassing, you just go to a door and you're, it's voter ID. You're asking people where they are on an issue and kind of just trying to talk them through it really quickly. These are like 20 minute long conversations. These wow. actually take a long time. You gotta show the video, you gotta talk people through it, you gotta help them sort of, you know, was there ever a moment in your life where you felt judged or excluded? You're trying to like really connect with them and, and kind of capture the empathy. Um, and the way we got to it was we actually did a number of experiments around the country where we um, had people go door to door talking about this issue and seeing the impact. You know, Deep Campus has been around for a while. We wanted to see if it worked on this issue. Um, and we went, we went door to door, we talked about this issue, and we did a control experiment where we talked about like plastic bags or something and people's opinion on whether or not there should be plastic bags in the world or something like that. Mm. Um, and we found that this actually works. It doesn't, um, it's not as much kind of tra traditional persuasion in the way that you would think about that where you're convincing somebody to like you. It's more a retention strategy. So the idea is, and people are probably familiar with this on a variety of issues impacting vulnerable communities, if you ask somebody, you know, how do you feel about non-discrimination, uh, people will tell you they think it's wrong, right? People generally mm -hmm. think of themselves as fair and kind. Um, but the minute they see an ad like this, and they see something that's much more personal to them, maybe it makes them think about their kids or their nieces or whatever, um, that's when we start to lose them. And so the idea is we're not trying to persuade them to like us. We're, they already believe in fairness. We're trying to win them back. 
and that's what the whole um, that's what the whole conversation is back. And we don't win them all back. We just need to win enough of them back to get more than fifty percent of the vote. Yeah. So in your experience, when you show people this attack ad, what are what feelings are you talking them through after they see it? Yeah, I mean, we're asking them questions about what did you think of this? What does this bring up for you? And ultimately, where we're trying to bring them back to is this empathy place, right? We have the opportunity to sort of talk them through. I mean, sort of what happens to them is they have an emotional reaction, right? They get flooded in their brains. They can't think clearly. They're scared. That's intentional. That's what the opposition wants them to do. We're trying to get them back into their, their logic brain. So we, we're soothing them a bit around the scary things and, and helping get them to a place where we can talk through whether or not this makes sense. And then we're trying to connect on a value level. Um, you know, talking about have you ever experienced you know, a time when you felt judged or excluded and really trying to get them to relate to transgender people because it's not necessary to understand another person. It's not necessary to understand what it's like to be transgender to believe that treating us bad is wrong. Mm. And that's where we're trying to get them. Yeah. Um, are there things that people can do between now and the, and the election that would be helpful to getting the word out about the campaign, about the question, all of the above? Absolutely. There's a lot to do. Um, the easiest thing that people can do, I mean, you would, you would be shocked. Maybe you wouldn't. I mean, it's all a bunch of queer people, right? Um, <laughs> that, like, so many people don't know this is on the ballot. I mean, there's lots of people who don't even know this past, right, because it doesn't impact them. So many people don't know this is on the ballot. We have got to spread the word that this is on the ballot. People are going to walk into the voting booth. They're not going to know what they're looking at, and they're not going to know what to do. And um, all the science shows that when people don't know what to do, they vote no, right? Huh. It's instinctual. So we, this has always been an uphill battle mm -hmm. for us because the way the statutes work that was the mechanism by which this qualified for the ballot, we are the yes vote. Um, so we are already naturally disadvantaged. So we need people to know that this is on the ballot. Um, and we need to make sure that people know to vote yes. So like literally spreading the gospel is the number one most important thing people can do without having to pick up a phone or get on their computer, et cetera. The number two thing you can do is go to freedomma.org and there are a ton of things on the website about ways that you can get engaged. There is an army of people who are out there every day having these kinds of conversations. There's other tasks too. There's data entry. There's all kinds of things that are needed to power a campaign like this. You can imagine trying to go statewide, trying to talk to as many people as we are with the tiny community that we have mm -hmm. um, and the resources it takes to fund a ballot measure like this, that a lot of this is built on volunteer work. And I will say, like, when I write my book, and nobody's allowed to steal this when I say the title right now. I'm copywriting <laughs> it right here. When I write my book, I literally think the title is going to be something like In the Hands of Strangers. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like, that's, you know, there are all these volunteers come in. We've never met them before. Um, maybe they don't even know any transgender people, but they just feel like discrimination is wrong. And it's like, our lives are in their hands. And that it, there's something so powerful about that. Um, and no matter what happens on November 6th, I just have so much gratitude for the love that is out there and how fiercely people are fighting for that right now. Yeah. And I know that thing for things like this, the language can be kind of tricky. So let's just clarify. Yes, I'm Yes free. to uphold, yes to protect, right? Yes to uphold protections for transgender people, no to repeal them. Yeah. Gotcha. I remember when I was a college student and Prop 8 was in California, I did some mm -hmm. calling for Prop 8 and it took like at least 30 seconds with everyone I called to figure out who, like if we were on the same page, yeah. like what yeah. voting yes meant, what vet, mo, vet, voting no meant. I feel like that's probably a thing that you're also going through. Yeah, and there are other similarities to, to Proposition 8 too, like uh, it's Massachusetts and people think it's uber liberal and blue and democratic and guess what? Like progressive people get scared too by videos like that. Mm -hmm. um, and even if there's a blue wave, we can't count on those people necessarily being with us. Like this issue is just not like that. Right. Um, it does not track uh, it does not track political party like that, which is why we have both progressives and conservatives, but we don't have all progressives and we don't have all conservatives. Um, and so I worry about uh, apathy and people taking for granted that um, people will do the right thing. I don't think we can take that for granted. We learned our lesson with Prop 8. We cannot do that here. Yeah. Um, we wanted to ask you a fun question also. Which I'm not is, that fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I'll but, give it a try. But you have been, it's a very stressful time. Mm -hmm. You're coming up on this vote. Uh, what are you going to do for fun once the vote is over and it sort of hopefully has gone yes? Well, it would be really fun to sleep. 
So that's probably the first thing I'm going to do. Um, and actually, this probably doesn't sound that fun to people, but uh, I was thinking I might actually shave my head. Ah. I am a transgender man myself, and one of the benefits of that is you begin to lose your hair, um, most of us. And uh, it's starting to go, and I thought I might just get like a preview. I'm gonna take like a month off work for reals, and uh-huh. so you know I don't uh-huh. have time to grow back and whatever. And so I might just give it a try. Do a power it's, it'll shave. be like so. I, I was a lesbian earlier in life, and so it'll be kind of like when I shave my head as a lesbian, but I'll, but I <laughs> but I have less hair now, and so I want to see like as a hasbian what does my <laughs> what does my hair look like? Great answer. I learned from the original Queer Eye that you could do a power shave. Oh That's yeah. A power shave. It's just like a little bit on this side. Just like a little no, I think that's a bowl cut. I did that thing. when I was a lesbian, oh, really? too. Okay. Yeah. All right, never mind. Never mind. That's a 90s thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well. Casey, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. For you. Having Give it up for Casey. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, folks. Moving along. We're almost to the end of the show, sadly. We have another segment after this. But before we do that, we are going to open it up to anyone in the audience who has questions for us. Probably not about science. (laughs) So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And there are folks with mics roaming through the audience. Oh, Oh, now we can see you. Look at you guys. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's okay if you don't have questions. We just thought we would open it up. What happens if we don't have questions? Anyone? Shall we? Anyone? Can I ask and, you a oh, question? Oh, here we go. Right here in front. It takes one and then it comes. Hi. First of all, thanks for coming to Boston. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Second of all, I wanted to ask, so as a queer Asian American, it's really great seeing um, queer Asian American representation. But I guess one of the things is, are there any trans people on your production or writing staff or like in your mm. research staff like the production staff of Nancy basically no we don't unfortunately so yeah our staff is limited in that sense we do hire uh, trans reporters to do pieces for us so those mm-hmm. are sort of how we get in freelance stories but to be totally transparent no there's not a trans person on our oh sorry I did not mean that <laughs> but yeah it is <laughs> Yeah, our staff is literally me, Tobin, and Matt Collette. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, but I should say, sorry, just on that check. um, One of the things that we are trying to do, we do have a limited staff, and that just sort of is what it is based on resources. But the way that we try to get voices into the door is people can pitch us stories, and then we do like freelance stories on the show. So one of the things we are constantly saying to people is please pitch us stories. Like if you hear something, or if you are not hearing something on the show and you have a story, please pitch us, because that is sort of the way that we're trying to fix that problem with our staffing. Yeah. Um, Just a simple question. Do you have any particularly favorite uh, moments from any of your experiences throughout any of the episodes or? I mean, I got to talk to Samara Wiley. That was way up there. (laughs) I nearly passed out. (laughs) Nearly. Luckily, we only had like 18 minutes with her. So I didn't make too much of a dumbass. I was up there. Um, One of my favorite moments was uh, from an episode we did called Here's What It's Like. Um, And it was our coworker who uh, is 60 years old. Uh, and has been living uh, HIV positive since um, the AIDS crisis in New York. Um, And he wanted to talk to a younger person who is currently HIV positive. Um, And there's a moment where they're doing this interview and um, they're talking about how many people they have lost and David, our coworker, says, I'm sorry. And there was something about like, what we always wanted to do with the show was make room for reporting that's not about queer people, but like queer people telling the story, queer people reacting, like that sort of like insular space. And so that moment where there's two people, they share this experience and one of them is able to say, I'm sorry, from a personal place. That was like, ha, this is what, in in a perfect world, this is what the show would always be doing. 
Um, so I, I would really love that moment. Next question right here. Thank you guys for coming. It's amazing to see your faces and hear your voices simultaneously. <laughs> um, I'm wondering what it's like to work at WNYC Studios and if you have a, a secret society of all the amazing podcast hosts that oh. come out of <laughs> WNYC Studios. Yes, there is a secret society. No, I'm just I wish. That'd be cool. I, did, I mean, it is cool to have so many creative people around and be able to bounce ideas off of folks. So like, Kathy and I were both lucky enough at one point or another to work for various radio lab properties. Um, mm. So like the ability to sometimes ask Jad Abumrad a question in the hall is cool. I also would say. the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. Super nice dude. Yeah. yeah. Next question in the center section. Hi. Hi. Um, first, I have a little like PSA for you guys, which oh. is to say that queer media takes support of lots of people and lots of money. So I hope people will consider joining me and being a Nancy supporter tonight. Oh, oh. thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thank you. definitely. Thank Please you. Do. It is the thing I donate to that I feel most proud and happy about. Oh. So thank you. That makes me emotional. Um, so season four is so amazing, and episodes uh, one and three were both shocking and depressing, and I'm hoping there was like a really happy ending that you just haven't told us yet. Oh, one and three. So one would be Perfect Son. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... And then three was the Joe story. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, so Perfect Son, um, the update basically on Jason and his dad is his dad is actually doing great. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And we'll have more of an update in an upcoming episode, but the, the short version is that um, the kidney seems to be taking, and um, the last time I saw Jason, he weirdly was like, I feel like you did this. And I was like, <laughs> no, not that powerful. Um, and then the update with uh, Joe would just be that they are friends now, I would say. There's mm -hmm. like a respectful friendship <laughs> happening there. Mm -hmm. um, and Peter's still single if anyone wants to hit him up. <laughs> yeah, he's very specific, specific about that. Hashtag looking for love. He meant it. So give him a call. Well, I don't know how, but. <laughs> Next question message. over here. Hi there. Um, this ask Hi. is actually for Matt Collette. Um, Matt Collette? Oh. Yeah. I'm ordaining a wedding in Texas this weekend. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask if you have any advice um, for ordaining for, for the first time. Oh, my God. This is the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> Spend a lot of time talking to the people and find out, like, what they want. Like, maybe they don't want you to, like, make jokes that are mean to them. Uh, maybe they do. Uh, and then I think, like, I did a wedding for my cousin uh, right here in Boston. Actually, both of them are in Boston. Massachusetts makes it really easy. You can get something called the one day efficient and like you just fill out a form and it's great. Uh, fun fact, it was so easy though that the first couple I did forgot to get their marriage license. So we secretly did their wedding again and their family doesn't know that one wasn't real. Uh, but the second one I did, I like talked to basically I'm not married, never been close, but I everybody in the the ceremony, like everybody there had been. So I like emailed and called and talked to a bunch of people and got like kind of crowdsourced some wisdom. And that worked really well. Uh, and like you don't have to say everything. Uh, oh, and the other, just the one important thing is in the, the dress rehearsal, there's not going to be anybody in the audience. So you won't have to tell people to sit down, but you will. And no one ever remembers. So just remember to tell everybody to sit down. Superstar producer Matt Collette, who does it all. Next question is right here in the middle. Hi, um, I'm a really Hi. big fan of the show. Um, I'm just really like happy and proud to see like two queer Asian Americans like thriving in media and being like successful and iconic and stunning. Um, <laughs> Ooh, so wow. my my question is um, for both of you. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses oh my God. or wow. one horse-sized duck? Wait, 100 duck-sized horses? Did 100 duck-sized horses. They bite? OK. I feel like 100 duck-sized horses. I, I feel like I could, like, it's just like kicking. <laughs> right? It's just kicking. This is where we differ. I go for the giant duck. 
Why? Because probably you can't move that fast, and I can run around it and then stab it in the back. Yeah, it's mm. like doing this yeah, exactly. the whole time. Yeah. Okay. This is why we're yin and yang. Yeah. <laughs> Together, we can kill them all. <laughs> Next, Next question, question right here in the middle. Hi, so my wife and I have been asked to officiate three weddings between the yeah. two of us. <laughs> You want to come back but, out? But only queer weddings. Yes. Is there something wrong with us? <laughs> Is this before or after gay marriage passed? A, a different level. Okay. A different levels. All right. 2019. Hmm. It just sounds like you're really good at officiating weddings. <laughs> also, whatever you're charging, which is probably nothing, you should charge more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're officiating their wedding. <laughs> They're off the hook. <laughs> Next, Next question th over here. Tobin, who did you want to win RuPaul season 10? Ooh. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and why is it Ms. Crack? What were the options? I... Uh, I mean, I feel like in my heart of hearts, I wanted Asia to just like bring it and take it. And then butterflies. That's all I have to say. I made a reference to butterflies the other day and somebody didn't get it and I was like, oh right, that's like a very niche thing. <laughs> like not everyone knows. So I, I would say Asia was my, my first choice to win. Or Monet Exchange. I hope Monet does really well in All Stars. I, that's a spoiler if I didn't know that. <laughs> We all, we all watch the YouTube videos that are like, who's the next cast? It's fine. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Last question in the front to the left. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question about your audience. Um, what do you guys know about your audience? And do you feel like your show reaches beyond the queer community? And if so, why do you think that is? Mm. Oh, we definitely do. Because we've gotten emails. We've said this a few times from like, 55 year old straight white guy that's like, we love the show. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. <laughs> and then, what's the thing that you always say? Well, I, th I think the way that we think about our audience is, uh, I'm gonna get metaphorical here, <laughs> but the way we think about our audience is like when you throw a stone in a pond. Um, so when we make our show, we think very intentionally about a queer audience, specifically queer POC. And that's sort of like where we're throwing the stone. But when you throw a stone in a pond, it creates these waves outward. And that only happens when you throw it a specific spot. And so I feel like when we think about audience, we throw very specifically, but then it seems to sort of wave out to other folks. And then maybe out here is straight cis folks who are interested and want to know more. But we're sort of thinking about that center spot the most. Um, and, and I think that's like a beauty of podcasting kind of thing, that it seems to be like the more specific you can be, the more you reach people. Because it feels mm -hmm. like they are being led into a world that maybe is not their own. And yeah. hopefully good storytelling is just universal. People can opt in. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, we're going to bring both of our guests back up for a very silly game. <laughs> Do you want to explain the game? Yeah. I have, like, no certainty about the slides at this point, but... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to... Nancy's Untitled Gay Animals, The Game Show. The Game Show! With your host... That's the longest part. <laughs> I don't know how to fade the music out on Keynote either. You can't. <laughs> so just believe me that I'm good at my job. Believe them. So today we're welcome everyone to the Untitled Gay Animals Game Show, the Game Show. Uh, please just remember, some people have said we do like serious, important things too, but that's just like remember that. But now we're going to play a little game where I'm going to tell you about gay animals. And I'm going to tell you three different stories about each gay animal. I'm going to tell you something, and you have to tell me the part that's true. Okay. Wait, so, so we have to identify the story that's true. Yeah, I'm going to give you, like, the beginning of a story, 
and then three possible endings. Okay. And, and then, then A, B, and C, and then you have cards that say A, B, and C. Okay. And then when it's right time to go, we just hold it hold up, it up and, and then whoever gets the most okay. wins. Okay. 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 It's like okay. really, it's really professional. <laughs> so first question. What? Uh, there we go. Oh. It's about penguins. Oh. So two like male penguins who built a nest from ice pebbles at an Australian zoo, at an Australian aquarium, have had which of these things happen to them? A, after they proved they were able to take care of a fake egg, they were entrusted with a real penguin egg to foster. B, they're now the subjects of a best-selling children's book. C, the penguins were sent to a different zoo. Wow. A, given a real egg. B, children's book. C, different zoo. Time to answer. Ready. Okay. <laughs> Set. Go. The correct answer was A. They got the they got to raise a child together. Wait, but there's wait, definitely a wait. children's book. We've won this game. Uh, yes, a fun Can fact I? about the children's book. That's and Tango makes three, mm. and those penguins are at the Central Park Zoo. And once when I tried to do a story, so they were about different them, penguins. Different yeah. penguins. It was a trick <laughs> question. It was a, a trick lot of gay question. penguins. I wanted and a combined A and B. Too bad. Oh. And when I asked the Central Park Zoo if I could interview someone about the penguins, the guy said, we have other animals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fun fact, about, fun fact about that children's book. Uh, my mom sent that children's book to my homophobic aunt. <laughs> Shots fired, mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Also in Australia. Researchers there have recently spotted an entire pod of male dolphins who uh, have been hooking up with each other. Scientists believe this is because, A, this is just common behavior among dolphins sort of exploring themselves. B, this particular pod of bottlenose dolphin were hooking up with each other until they found female dolphins who they could mate with. Uh, the scientists called this the wingman approach. <laughs> or C, pollution has turned the dolphins gay. <laughs> A, this is normal. B, just the wingman stuff. C, pollution. Ready, yes. set, answer. You're all wrong, it's B. What? They're what? just waiting to find some lady dolphins. So the, are the, the, the dolphins are on homophobic? a spectrum then? I, I think, mean, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the researchers That's a homophobic are study. homophobic. Yeah. yeah. I just, someone else Googled these things and then I turned them into questions. <laughs> don't blame me. I know you're new to science, but wing seems incredibly unscientific to me. Yeah. Number three, bonobos. Not just a place to buy colorful pants. <laughs> they are also a species of great ape, and they share 98.7% of their genetic code with them. Uh, one of the most famous books about bonobos by Duke primatologist Vanessa Williams is called The Bonobo Handshake. That title refers to, A, how heads of bonobo clans are known to, have se to use sex as a way to settle territorial disputes. B, groups of young male bonobos are known to engage in mutual acts of self-pleasure. Or C, bonobos have been frequently known to engage in non-reproductive sex with other bonobos, regardless of gender, as a common form of just greeting. Which one is the bonobo handshake? Oh a, boy. dispute settling. Three, just young guys hanging out. C, it's how they say hello. Ready, set, go. What are you going to Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. It's C. Yeah. Yes. So right now, Tobin has none right. <laughs> Casey and Kathy each have two right, and Nick has one right. I have two more questions to go. How do you so. know that? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. After two male lions were photographed having sex together, the head of the Kenya Film Classification Board had his own explanation for what was happening. A, the lions just could not wait to be king. <laughs> B, the lions had been possessed by demons. Uh... <laughs> See, the lions learned this from Americans visiting on safari. <laughs> what did the official from the Kenya Film Classification Board say to explain this behavior? I don't know. A, can't wait to be king. B, demons. C, blame America. <laughs> Ready, set, go. B! Yeah, All right. Minutes. So now everyone but Tobin <laughs> has two points. <laughs> and Tobin has one. Or zero. No, I have zero. Yep. I have zero points. Good thing you're honest. Okay, finally. Last one. Uh, it's really anybody but Tobin's game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, fine. Male and female ab albatross or albatrosses uh, mate for life. But scientists found that on a 
on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, almost a third of the pairs of albatrosses were instances where both pair, pairs were where both parents were female. Uh, how were these same-sex albatross pairs able to continue to raise chicks each year? Is it A, the female albatross would take turns visiting nearby male albatross, then return back to the nest and raise their child in a two-mother nest? Was it B, scientists believe this could be the first documented case of immaculate conception in birds? <laughs> mm. Or C, the birds are not really raising new chicks at all, but instead serving more of a cool lesbian aunt role within their community? <laughs> Ready, set, go. Oh! Kathy's wrong. Damn it. A is right. So Nick and Casey are tied to be winners. Yay. Do we get a runoff? Oh, do you have do you have a tiebreaker question? No. Oh. Those are all the facts <laughs> well, you're I could find about gay animals. <laughs> and with that, that is our live show. Thank you all for Thank coming you for out. Coming. Thank you, Boston. Congratulate these two. Clearly, we didn't cheat. Let's have another <laughs> hand for all five of our guests tonight, please. Thank you so much. The evening is not over. We invite you to join us for a reception one level down. These folks will be there to continue the conversation. Thank you. We hope to see you back here soon at the museum. Have a great night.